Uh, hello everyone, um, good evening friends and knowledge seekers. Uh, my name is Hugh Smee, I'm your host for this evening. I'm delighted to welcome you this, to this rearranged uh, Northern Ireland Science Festival event and introduce our, our speaker tonight, Anil Seth. Uh, we are joined from around the world on what used to be called the Information Superhighway when I was a young man. So please make sure that you have mobiles switched off or at least to silent so that somebody in Chile or Cork doesn't think that some, a phone is ringing in the back of their house or something like that. So uh, please be mindful of that if you can. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping tonight. Uh, you're going to hear from Anil Seth for about an hour and then Anil, I'm going to join Anil on stage and we're going to talk about uh, some of the issues and themes. Uh, there'll then be a chance for you to ask questions yourselves. So please do during the event, if you think of a question, uh, please take your chance um, then. And then uh, at the end of the event, uh, Anil will be signing books, his new book, uh, at the, uh, the front foyer. You may have seen it as you, you came in, uh, into the auditorium tonight. So uh, without further ado, I'd just like to say a few words as, as introduction. Um, Anil Seth is Professor of Cognitive and Computational Neuroscience at the University of Sussex and comes to Belfast to introduce his latest book, Being You, A New Science of Consciousness. While the poets of the ages have mused on our place in the world, science has perhaps dismissed consciousness as an unsolvable problem, until scientists like Anil over the, have, over the last 25 years, begun to create theories and ideas that begin to explain how understanding of the world and our place in it. We live in an age of angst, an age where identity and self seem challenged by the world around us, could the science of consciousness provide mechanisms and answers to help us? We're delighted to have Anil here tonight at the MAC to talk about his work. So please give a big Belfast welcome to Anil Seth. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's a, real, it's a real pleasure to be here. I was supposed to be here in February, so this is really nice to be here now. And um, the weather is lovely. I must admit, is it always like this? Uh, I won't talk for quite an hour, I promise. I'll talk for a bit less than that, so I'll have more time for, for Q&A. Um, but yeah, I'm here to see if we can shed a little bit light on this potentially unsolvable problem of consciousness. And where I want to start is with an experience or, or non-experience that I had a few years ago. I was having a small operation, and my brain was filling with anaesthetic. And I just remember this sense of blackness of falling apart and then I was gone and what was remarkable was that I was gone and then I was back and no time seemed to have passed at all now when you fall asleep you might be confused about how much time has passed when you wake up it might have been a few hours whether you've got jet lag or something but you know that some amount of time has passed there's a continuity between your consciousness then in consciousness when you wake up. But general anesthesia is, is totally different. It has to be, really, otherwise you wake up pretty quickly when surgeons started cutting you open. In anesthesia, you are just simply not there. It's a bit like uh, the oblivion that we might all encounter when we die. You are simply do not exist. It's a kind of magic, really. People get turned into objects and then back again into people. And what's remarkable about, about anesthesia is that it just highlights how fragile, how precarious, and how apparently miraculous consciousness is. When it's gone, it's really gone, and you're gone. And all that's happening is a disruption, a disturbance to the electrochemical machinery that we carry around within our skulls, which is our, our brain. A small tweak of that, and you are just not there. The basic ground state of what it is to be is completely abolished. And in this process lies one of the biggest mysteries in all of science and philosophy, and this is the mystery of consciousness. Somehow, within each of our brains, the activity, the combined activity of many billions of neurons, each one of them a tiny biological machine, is giving rise to a conscious experience. And not just any experience, your experience right here, right now, listening to me talk. How does this happen? Why do we experience life in the first person? This is what I want to talk about this evening. 
So as always, it's best to begin with a definition. What, what is consciousness? Well, there are many different definitions of consciousness, and the one I prefer to start with comes from the philosopher called Thomas Nagel. Thomas Nagel said, an organism has conscious mental states if and only if there is something it is like to be that organism. What he means by this is that this, it feels like something to be me. It feels like something to be each of you. It probably feels like something to be a bat, too. Thomas Nagel had this very famous paper in philosophy, What is it like to be a bat? And his, his main thrust of argument there was that you can't really know what it's like to be a bat unless you are a bat. But there is something it feels like for the bat to be a bat. A bat on this view is conscious. But this lectern here, this laptop computer, the table over there, it doesn't feel like anything to be any of those systems. These are not conscious. So there is a difference. What is the difference between a conscious system and a non-conscious system? This seems to be a very challenging problem. And indeed, it's been called by another philosopher, David Chalmers, a more recent philosopher, um, the hard problem of consciousness. And Chalmers puts the problem like this. He says, it is widely agreed that experience arises from a physical basis, but we have no good explanation of why and how it so arises. Why should physical processing give rise to a rich inner life at all? It seems objectively unreasonable that it should, and yet it does. The intuition for Chalmers here is that you have this hard problem. You also have a lot of easy problems. The easy problems in neuroscience are not easy at all in the sense of being simple to solve, but they're conceptually easy. They're problems like, how does the brain work as a mechanism? You know, the brain is just some stuff, really. Complex set of biological wires and chemicals sloshing about. But it is just a mechanism. Sensory information comes in. We do stuff. We talk. We move our arms around. We have thoughts. That's a mechanism. Um, and in principle, science can unravel all these mechanisms, just in the same way it can unravel other things, like how does a bacteria work? But Chalmers' intuition is that even if we solve all the pro easy problems about how the brain works as a complex machine, the hard problem of how and why any of this should be accompanied by experience would be as mysterious as ever. Why doesn't all the business of the brain just go on in the subjective dark. That's the hard problem. Now, there's a problem with the hard problem, I think, which is it treats consciousness as like one big scary mystery, like one huge problem that's in need of a kind of eureka solution that would change our view about everything. But there's another way to study consciousness, to think about consciousness. And this is a way, it's like, I call it the real problem, just to sort of have a slight dig at David Chalmers, but it's... Um, it's what a lot of us neuroscientists and psychologists do in practice, in a way. And the real problem is simply this. It's to sort of accept that consciousness exists, because some philosophers might even try and persuade you that consciousness experience doesn't really exist, which is one way to get rid of the hard problem. And there's no problem. Uh, but consciousness exists. In fact, it's the only thing we can be really certain of. We are, each of us now, conscious. And brains exist too, and the question is, how can the mechanisms and processes in the brain and the body explain, predict, and control properties of consciousness? Not necessarily how and why consciousness exists in the universe at all, but what its different properties are like. In my conscious experience right now, I'm having a visual experience which has a particular kind of character. There are people, there are objects, they're arranged in space, they have colors. I also experience my body, myself, and I can experience hearing myself talk. There's different kinds of experiences that are different from each other. These are the properties of consciousness. And if we can understand how each of those relates to different things happening in the brain and the body, we can get somewhere. This is not the hard problem because it's not, as I said, trying to explain how consciousness is part of the universe or emerges from material stuff. And it's not the easy problem either, because I'm trying to explain things about consciousness and about what experience is like. So it's the real problem. And there's a, a good historical precedent for thinking about consciousness this way. If you think about life, this was another big mystery in science. 
not that long ago. Still is a mystery in many ways. But about, well, 100, 150 years ago, biologists and physicists and chemists of the day thought that life, the property of being alive, couldn't be explained in terms of physics and chemistry. That there had to be something else. There had to be some sort of magical, supernatural spark, the spark of life. Elan Vital, that would explain the difference between the non-living and the living. But the history of our understanding of life didn't go that way. Nobody found the spark of life. What happened instead, biologists didn't even look for it. What they did was identify the different properties that living systems have, things like metabolism, homeostasis, you know, they, they maintain themselves in particular states, reproduction, lots of things characterize living systems, no single thing. And each of those individual things can be explained. And as biologists did this, the sense that there was something magical, unexplainable, faded away. The hard problem of life wasn't solved, it was dissolved. And what I hope to give you a sense of this evening is the same strategy can work for consciousness. Instead of solving this magical mystery, we explain the different properties of consciousness and dissolve the hard problem of consciousness. So what are these problems of, what are these properties of consciousness? Well, there are many ways to cut the cake. The way I prefer to do it is just into sort of three different areas, three different kinds of consciousness. There's level. I started talking about this. The difference between wakeful consciousness that we all have now general anesthesia when it goes away, sleep and dreaming, and other different global states of consciousness. How do we explain the difference between these states? Then there's conscious content. When you are conscious, you're conscious of something. The people, the places, the objects, the emotions, the thoughts, the beliefs that together define your experience at any one time. And then perhaps... For each of us, the most important aspect of consciousness is the experience of being a self, of being who you are. You know, this is how I first, I think, got interested in this subject, and I was very young. I think most people, as kids, ask themselves at some point, like, who am I? Why am I me? Where was I before I was born? Where will I go when I die? Understanding the nature of self, the experience of being a self, is part of what being conscious for us human beings is all about. So I want to just talk a little bit about the last two of these, content and self. I, I won't talk about level today um, because of time. But let's start with thinking about conscious content. How can we begin to understand the nature of our experience of the world around us? And I'll focus on vision because it's, uh, we are quite visual creatures and there's quite a lot known about how vision works in, in the human brain. Now, our eyes open our brains to the visual world, but our eyes are only sensitive to a very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum, the, the, the wavelengths of light that are out there. This isn't even neuroscience, this is physics. We have this electromagnetic spectrum, it goes all the way from radio waves, etc. Um, the visible spectrum, which is that very thin slice to gamma waves at the top. So in a sense, what we see, what we consciously see, is much less than what's actually there. Everything that we visually experience comes from this thin slice of reality. But in another sense, what we experience is much more than what's there. The cells in our eyes that are sensitive to colour are only sensitive to three different wavelengths in this whole spectrum. Yet out of those three wavelengths, we generate an enormously rich palette of colours, millions, many millions of colours. So colour is a construction of the brain. It's not a direct reflection of what's out there. And there's a little demonstration I want to give you here which uh, drives that home, and I hope it works here. I, know I forgot to try this out earlier. It should work. I don't know how many people have seen this before, this particular demonstration. Please. See? A few of you. Okay, not many though. So what I'd like you to do is focus your eyes on the black cross at the centre and try not to blink, try not to move your eyes around. And now, just raise your hands if you can see 
a green patch revolving around, like a green patch. Okay, that's, that's most people, I think. Maybe the other people would be like. And now if you blink and move your eyes, the, um, the green patch should go away, right? And the magenta patches come back. Everybody see that? Yeah, okay. So this is an illusion called the Lilac Chaser by, by Jeremy Hinton. It's one of my favorite illusions. There is no green patch at all anywhere in this. All that's happening is that these, these magenta patches are disappearing and reappearing one by one in order around the circle. Why does this work? Well, it's actually a combination of three different effects going on here. The first effect is called troxler fading in psychology. This is the, the effect that when something is out of the centre of your vision, like off to the side, and its border is a little bit fuzzy and indistinct, like each of those patches are, then that thing can often fade out of our experience and the brain just sort of fills in with what's around it. The other effect is, uh, the second effect is apparent motion. So when things appear and disappear near each other, the brain infers movement between them. This is how cinema works. You know, you see frames, one after the other, and, but we perceive continuous motion. And the third thing that's happening is colour opponency. Now, we just talked a little bit already about how the brain creates colour. And what happens in the brain when it, get, when it sort of experiences a particular colour and that colour disappears, then there's an after effect, a kind of rebound, and the brain perceives the, the opposite colour in colour space. And the opposite colour in colour space to magenta is, is green. There's actually another thing going on here, which is colours as we know, don't exist out there in the world. Our brain makes up colours in a collaboration with the world. But magenta exists even less than other colours. Um, and this is because you make magenta by mixing red and blue light together. And when you mix red and blue light together, in this whole spectrum, sort of green is in between them. What we, we experience is green is in between them. But there's no green. So the brain has to make something up. And what it makes up when it's expecting green but not getting green, is magenta. So then when the magenta disappears, what you experience is not not green. OK? <laughs> Good. I'm glad that's clear. But how, how do we understand this? What's, you know, what's the basic process that's underlying, not just your strange experience here, but your, all your experiences all the time? And the idea that I want to get across to you today is that your brain is a prediction machine that Everything that you see, hear, feel, and nothing more than your brain's best guesses about what's out there. Now, this is a surprisingly simple idea. It's a very old idea, actually, in both science and philosophy. It goes all the way back, at least to Plato, and his allegory of the cave. In his allegory of the cave, prisoners are chained to the wall of a cave, and they see shadows on the, on the walls cast by firelight. And they take the shadows to be the real world because that's all they have access to. Now, the modern version of that, that kind of allegory uh, can be thought of a bit like this. Just change your perspective for a minute and imagine that you are your brain, that you're locked inside the bony vault of your skull, trying to figure out what's out there in the world. Now, it's completely dark inside your, inside your skull. You know, it seems as though this world of sound and colour just pours itself directly into your minds. But no, there's this kind of opaque curtain. Your brain is insulated from the light and the sound. All your brain has access to is electrical signals that only indirectly reflect whatever's out there, whether it's objects of different kinds or a sunset or whatever it might be. And so the brain has to make sense of these ambiguous sensory inputs. They don't come with labels on, like I'm from a cat or a coffee cup. They don't even come with labels on that I'm from the eyes or the ears or the stomach. The brain has to figure out what caused these sensory signals. And it does so by combining its prior expectations. The brain has lots of built-in knowledge about the way the world works. It combines that prior knowledge with the sensory signals to figure out its best guess of what's there. And the idea is that that is what we consciously perceive. We don't directly read out the world. We actively generate it all the time, everywhere. 
Now, there's a couple more quick demonstrations of this that, that I want to show you. You may have seen uh, these before. How many people have seen this, this before? This is quite a familiar illusion. So, like, a few of you still. This is called Adelson's checkerboard. And if you look at this, I want you to look at these two um, squares on this checkerboard, A and B. Now, I hope for you they should look to be different shades of grey. Yeah? One is lighter than the other, or appears to be lighter than the other. But, of course, this is not true. It's an illusion, so I'm messing with you. So they are, in fact, exactly the same shade of grey. And I can show this here by, by joining them up with a, with a rectangular bars that are one uniform shade of grey. And if you think I'm still messing you around, well, I'll just move that bar across. And you can see it really is the same shade of grey. But if I take it away, they look different again. So what's happening here? Well, what's happening here is that the brain, your brain, has encoded in its wiring the knowledge that objects in shadow appear darker than they are. And this is why we end up perceiving B as lighter than it really is. And even when you notice, it still doesn't prevent you from experiencing it that way. One more example. And this is an example that shows just how quickly new expectations in your brain can change what you might consciously experience. So have a listen to this sound. I hope it works. Let's see. The sound isn't working all of a sudden. So you are supposed to hear something. This isn't, this isn't part of the, uh, the demonstration. I think Brett. Brett. Whoa, whoa, yep, yep. Okay. Right. That almost gave it away. So let's, let's try this again. Let's see if the sound is working. Have a listen. What is going on here? I think, I think Brett. Oh, oh, oh. We might have to skip this one and come back to it, but never mind if we do. Okay. I have in my notes here. Here's another example, if it works, which shows that <laughs> this is always. No, it's not working. Hold on. I'm going I'm to try. I really want to make this one work. Why is that not coming through? Huh. OK. Well, we're going to have to pass over that one. I might come back to it at the end, but I can't fix it now. So um, what's happening in cases like this, uh, both the example that you saw and the one you didn't, so you'll just have to take my word for that about that one, is that um, your brain is, is, is trying to combine again its prior beliefs about what's happening in the world with the data that it gets. And there's like, this is the only equation I'll have in the whole talk. And there is a, a formula for this. It's called Bayesian inference from the Thomas, the Reverend Thomas Bayesian in the 17th century. And Bayesian inference is just a way of reasoning in situations that are uncertain. When, when, you, don't, when you don't know what's going on, how should you update your beliefs when you get, when you get new data? So if you look at this thing here, basically the likelihood is like new stuff and it's sort of, if the task is like, is there a gorilla in front of me now? Maybe there is. Your, so your, your new data is like, yes, there's a gorilla. Um, your prior belief, maybe you're just in a supermarket, so you don't usually expect to see gorillas in the supermarket. So your prior belief is that there's not much, you know, there's not a gorilla. And then the idea is you combine these things in a way that's sort of, weighted by how certain you are, and you come up with, with something in the middle. And that's the, called the posterior belief in Bayesian inference. And that's, the idea here is that is what you perceive. The brain is always updating its belief with new data according to this, this sort of rough uh, framework. That was just a mathematical framework. It wasn't, it's not just about brains. Scientists and engineers have used this, this principle to do all sorts of things, like how to find missing nuclear submarines and how to work out um, whether uh, you know, the likelihood of having a disease if a test comes back positive, all sorts of things. The first person to really think about this in terms of his theory of the brain was the German psychologist and physiologist, Hermann von Helmholtz. And 
he realized that perception must be doing something like this. It must be this process of the brain continually guessing what's out there. But he also realized that we're not aware of our brains doing this, but only aware of the outcome of all this stuff that's going on under the hood. And thinking of things this way, as Helmholtz started doing more than 100 years ago, really changes how we think about perception. And this is something I keep coming back to, just not only in my research, but in everyday life too. Like the classical view, the intuitive view of how perception works is as a kind of outside-in or bottom-up process. So this is, the, this is a picture of a monkey brain, and the class, the sort of standard idea of perception is that sensory signals come in from the world, they come into the eye, and they sort of march deeper and deeper into the brain, and at each stage within the brain, like more complex things are extracted from this flow, this river of incoming information. So at early stages of processing, like V1, the brain might pick out things like edges or lines or orientations. And then at deeper levels in the brain, you get whole uh, things like faces and objects and and people, well, monkey people, monkeys. Um, there's a monkey brain. Uh, but the, the important thing is that in this view, the heavy lifting is all done from the outside in, as if the world is just coming into the brain. Now, the view of the brain as a prediction machine changes all of this. Instead of our experience depending primarily on signals coming into the brain and being read out, it depends just as much, if not more, so these are the sensory signals coming in. That would be the classic view. It depends just as much, if not more, on these perceptual predictions flowing from the top down, from the inside out. In this view, the sensory signals that are coming in aren't being read out by the brain. They're just updating the brain's predictions, calibrating the brain's best guesses. And what we really see is all coming from the top down or the inside out. We actively generate our worlds. We don't just passively perceive them. So in this view, this is called predictive processing in the, in the scientific literature. The central idea is that perceptual contents, what we perceive, are conveyed by these top-down prediction errors and so top-down predictions and the bottom-up, the outside-in signals just convey these prediction errors, the difference between what the brain gets and what it expects at every level of processing. Now, we've done a few, well, there's been many experiments that try and see whether this is actually what's going on. I won't tell you, I'll just tell you about one or two of them from our lab. So this was done quite a few years ago now with a colleague of mine, Yai Pinto. And what we did here was we used a technique, which is called, it's called continuous flash suppression, but it's very simple. What you do basically is you, you have a situation where you can show separate images to somebody's two eyes. So in their left eye, what they see is, um, or in one of their eyes, what they see is this changing pattern of coloured blobs, which just keeps, keeps changing, um, and gradually fades away. And in their other eye, what they see is an image, either of a house or a face, that gradually appears out of darkness. And when the two eyes are getting these things at the same time, what the person sees starts by being the coloured blobs, but at some point, the image, whether it's a house or a face, breaks through, and that's what they see. And what we also do is we cue them, we, we, we flash up a word, either face or house, to give them the expectation that what they're about to see is a house or a face. So the question here we're asking is, if we make people expect to see face, do they see face? Do they see it more quickly or more accurately than if their expectation doesn't match the sensory data. And that's exactly what we find. And the effect is, it's like, basically, when the brain's predictions align with the sensory information coming from the world, we perceive what's out there more quickly and more accurately than when there's a mismatch between what the brain expects and what it gets. So it's not really a case of what we would normally say, which is, you know, in, in everyday life, that I believe it when I see it, but we could equally and perhaps more accurately say that when we walk around the world, it's a case of I'll see it when I believe it. So what we see is determined by the brain's beliefs much more so than the other way around. Now, we're all a bit familiar with this. We're all familiar with this, this sort of tendency for our brains and minds 
to project patterns into things, to impose its expectations into our, into our experienced environments. I mean, one thing I think most of us are familiar with is this phenomenon of being able to see faces in clouds. You, know, you walk around on a day when there's these little white fluffy clouds and sometimes you'll see faces, sometimes you'll see people, sometimes you'll see animals. Um, I once saw a bunch of Scylla Blacks walking through the sky. Um, there's a word for this. It's called pareidolia, which is a, a general word which means seeing patterns in things. We can even see faces in, in the windows of churches. There's this brilliant Twitter feed called Faces Pigs, which is... And, and the, this is perhaps not surprising because for us humans, faces are very, very important things. You know, they, they matter a lot. The ability to recognise, identify faces and different facial expressions is hugely important for us as a species. So the brain is fine-tuned to expect to, to sort of latch on to face-like things everywhere. And so we actually start to see faces even when there are no faces there. So these are sort of found examples. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do in my lab a few years ago was sort of use this idea to try and simulate, try and understand what would happen if the brain really had very strong expectations to see things that, that weren't actually there. Could we use this idea of the brain as a prediction machine to simulate different kinds of experience when people you know, don't see the world as it, as it really is? And this is what we did with this thing called a hallucination machine. So this was work by my, my colleague and friend, Kezuke Suzuki. And what we did here, this is, Sussex, this is Sussex campus. Welcome to my university. This is what it looks like on a Tuesday lunchtime. Except that it doesn't, of course. What we did here is we took a panoramic video of this courtyard uh, at Sussex. Um, so 360-degree video. And then we processed every frame through a particular program. And that program was, base was basically like a a network, a neural network that's usually used, you feed it information in at the bottom and it tells you what's in the image. And we ran it backwards and we basically fixed, the, fixed it so that it's to say dog and then we ran it backwards and updated every frame of this image to project dog back into it. And then we sort of strung them all together in a movie and people put a headset on and they look around and suddenly there are dogs everywhere. So this is a sort of simulation of what you might experience if your brain had very strong predictions to see dogs. And what I find interesting about this is that it's not just, as, it's not just like dog images have been photoshopped onto it. The dogs are sort of organically growing out of the image in, in a very odd and semi-natural way. I mean, there are some parallels between this simulation and some you know, kinds of experiences people might have, um, having taken some sorts of substances, perhaps. Uh, but it, it serves to to simulate, it shows that we can use models of this idea of perception to actually simulate not what people do, but what kinds of experiences they might have. What we're doing at the moment, just to give you a sense, is taking this work forward using a bit more complicated model. These are all models based on the visual cortex, on of the part of the brain that deals with vision, but we want to simulate different kinds of altered experience now, because this can actually become useful. We can start to understand, for instance, why people with psychosis have the particular kinds of experiences they have, why people with Parkinson's disease have, who also have hallucinations, why they have the kinds of hallucinations that they have. So we, we started modeling these different kinds of hallucinations. This just gives you a flavor of, we start out with a bunch of images and then we, we run it through the system and we generate different kinds of hallucinatory images using this, this method. Um, so this is just one way in which research into consciousness can actually be useful because we can now go to different groups of people who have these conditions like Parkinson's or psychosis or dementia and we can ask them like, how similar are these to these sorts of things to the experiences that you have and begin to get a grip of what's actually going on for them. Okay, so just to finish this part, what we saw in these last examples is really that when we talk about something like hallucination, usually it means seeing something that isn't there or that other people don't see. But it's better thought of as a kind of perception, but uncontrolled. Now, the brain's predictions have lost their grip on their causes in the world. So if hallucination is a kind of uncontrolled perception, then normal perception in the here and now, right here and right now, can also be thought of as a kind of hallucination 
but as a controlled hallucination, a situation in which the brain's predictions, best guesses about the world, are continually reined in by sensory signals coming from the world. We're, you know, we're kind of, on this view, we're all hallucinating all the time. It's just that when we agree about the hallucinations we have, well, that's what we call reality. And I've shown you this sort of idea in very simple situations, like for seeing faces or seeing dogs um, and seeing houses. But it applies the idea, or the, the idea that I'm pursuing in the research over years now is that this applies to everything. It applies everywhere and all the time, all the different kinds of our experiences, whether they're of, of taste, of sound, of time, of colour, of touch, or even the experience of what is real and what is not. They're all just different kinds of prediction, different ways in which the brain is trying to make a best guess about the causes, the structure of the sensory input that it gets. And... Um, Another way to say this, and this comes from, from the novelist Anais Nin, is that we do not see things as they are. We see things as we are. So perception is, is for each of us, it's an individual process. It depends on the, the particular structure, the particular idiosyncrasies of our own minds and brains. OK, so that was a little bit about content. And in the, the second part of the talk, I want to move on to self try to understand a bit more about the experience of being a self in the world. And this involves another kind of flip. I mean, we've already talked about how it might seem as though perception of the world sort of just flows from the outside in, but in fact it comes from the inside out. Another way to think about another common intuition has to do with the self. And the idea here is there is a world and we sense the world, and it's the self that does the perceiving. The self is the recipient of all the sensory information and that forms perceptions of the world. Like the self is this little mini me that's perched inside the skull that's reading out all this information and is doing the perceiving and deciding what to do. But what I want to suggest is that this is also not true and that both the world as it appears and the self are forms of perception. The self is not the thing that does the perceiving. The self is a kind of perception too. And a way into thinking about this is to think about what it means for us humans to experience being a self. What is it like to be you? There are actually a number of different elements, a number of different aspects of the experience of being a human self. There's the bodily self. This is the experience of having and being a body. You know, this object right here, this is part of my body, but that lectern is not. This seems obvious, seems we could take it for granted, but we shouldn't. Then there's the perspectival self. I tend to experience the world, and we all do, from a particular first-person point of view, usually somewhere slightly behind my eyes, in my forehead somewhere. Then there's the volitional self, the, the experience of being the cause of action, the cause of things happening, intending to do something in the world, this urge to, to, you know, to do something, what people also call free will, the experience of free will. Then there's the narrative self. The narrative self is the first point at which the, your name and your sense of personal identity might come in. So you know, we don't just experience ourselves as a body, we, we have a set of memories and plans and imaginations about the future that we associate with a sense of identity and with a name. And then finally, there's this idea of the social self. I think this is really important, that what it feels like to be me depends partly on how I experience others perceiving me, my best guesses about how others are perceiving the contents of my own mind. So our own sense of self, in this view, is partly refracted through the minds of others. Like I already know that some of my friends in, in Brighton have much better memories than me, and so part of my self is actually in their minds, because they remember things that happened uh, to us together that, that I don't. So we are partly already constituted by other people. Now, I want to just focus in, a, in the few minutes here on this idea of the embodied self, this part of the experience of selfhood that is really deeply tied to this thing that is the body. And there's a very well-known 
experiment that illustrates how changeable this is. Because the, the idea is much the same, that this, this experience of body is not to be taken for granted. It's another kind of perceptual prediction. The brain is making its best guess all the time about what is and what is not part of the body. And a very fun demonstration of this is called the rubber hand illusion. How many people have seen the rubber hand illusion? It's, it's, it's always worth seeing again. This is, um, you can do this at home. It's really, I'm sure everybody's got rubber hands at home. I've got at least three. Um, what happens in the rubber hand illusion is that this, the person who's experiencing the illusion sits behind a table. His real hand is hidden from view behind this cardboard partition and a fake rubber hand is placed in front of him in roughly the position where his real hand might be. It's facing the right way and it's not sort of... Um, yeah. It's roughly where his real hand should be. And then he's focusing his attention on the fake hand and the experimenter, the guy in the green shirt, strokes both the fake hand and the real hand in synchrony. And so what happens is that the, the guy in blue, he's seeing a fake hand, but he's seeing the fake hand be, being touched, and at the same time he's feeling touch because his real hand is being touched at the same time. So the standard story about this is that the brain makes its best guess. It puts together. It's like, oh, I see a hand, and I feel touch, and it doesn't look much like a hand, but, you know, whatever. That's enough evidence, and so this is my hand. And, you, and the person starts to have this uncanny experience that this fake hand is in some way part of his body. So this is what it looks like. And there are various ways to test whether the illusion is working. But there's one way in particular which I think is by far the best way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't think he's faking when he, you know, when he draws his hand away. I think it's really a, a thing. You can, you, can, yeah, you can do various versions of this and make it even more interesting if you want. Uh, but, so that's the standard story. And it is quite powerful. I mean, it's not as if the person really believes that that rubber hand is their hand. I mean, they know it isn't. Um, and that's in contrast. There are some conditions. There's a condition in, in neurology called somatoparaphrenia, which I will ask you all to remember and repeat later, which is a condition whereby people really believe that their limbs belong to somebody else. Like, if I had somatoparaphrenia, I might really believe that this arm, in fact, belongs to a friend of mine, my brother, or something like that. Uh, in this case, that, that doesn't happen. But it still can be quite an uncanny feeling. And as I said, the, the, the story is that the brain is just putting together this, this weird sensory data and making its best guess. But that's not the whole story. We did an experiment with my colleague Peter Lush a few, about four, eight, four years ago in Sussex now, the world's largest rubber hand study. And what we noticed was that different people experienced this illusion to different degrees. And so we wanted to understand this. So we, we ran this. We had this kind of rubber hand factory going on for about a week, and tested about 400 people on the rubber hand illusion. But we also measured how hypnotically suggestible they were. Hypnosis is a real thing. It's not just stage trickery. We're all hypnotically suggestible to some degree, and that is a very stable and reliable thing. Much like you know, our height, we're asking that it's a very predictable, stable thing. And it turns out that the degree to which you experience the rubber hand illusion correlates very strongly with the degree to which you're hypnotically suggestible. And this, for us, was very interesting because it suggests that what's happening in, in a case like this is that, really, when you, um, when you set up the situation like this, you're giving somebody the very strong expectation that they ought to experience this hand as being theirs. It's like you put a fake hand in front of them and you stroke it and you ask them, does this hand feel like your hand? And so for those people who are quite uh, suggestible, and that's not meaning gullible, it's not a bad thing, it just means their brains are more able to take expectations on and that shape their experience. They will have their experience more strongly. In fact, that might be all that's going on in this case and a lot of other cases. And... Um, so we, we, yeah, that's what we found with the rubber hand illusion. It's not just limited to that either. We did a, a, a whole bunch of things after this. So the rubber hand illusion, there's also a phenomenon called vicarious pain. Now, some people, if they see, let's say, somebody being poked with a needle, they will feel pain. Some people do, some people don't. I see you two are wincing. You probably do. Um, so you're probably highly suggestible. Congratulations. Um, 
But that correlates very strongly as well. Again, you're giving people a strong suggestion about what to experience. Works with other things like, uh, I won't talk about that too much, AS, a, a, AMSR or ASMR is this thing, it's very popular on social media now. People have these, these uh, usually pleasant sensations when watching videos of people folding handkerchiefs and whatever else they do. Uh, again, it's a very strong encouragement. You, people know what they ought to experience, and this is very strongly correlated with hypnosis. So is this one. You remember seeing this one? How many people feel, sort of have a sensation of sound when, when they see the pylon hitting the ground? Not so many, but, but a lot of people, apparently when this was done online, a big survey, about 300,000 people, the vast majority did. Again, it's very strongly correlated, but not everything, like simple visual illusions like this. This is called the muller liar illusion, where these two lines look to be different lengths. This doesn't correlate at all with, with hypnosis. So there are some things that, that do and some things that, that don't. And the reason I wanted to show this is partly because it's, it's, it's new stuff, partly because it's rehabilitating this very old idea of hypnosis, which has got quite a bad name in psychology. It really, it's, it's true, and it can be rethought, I think, in terms of the brain's susceptibility to top-down predictions that it imbibes from its environment. Okay, so I'm, ne I'm nearing the end of this, of the talk now, but there's something I did want to focus on right at the end, which is the experience of an embodied self isn't just about what object in the world is my body, whether it's a rubber hand or not. This is the experience you might call of having a body. There's also a much deeper experience of simply being a body, of being a living, breathing organism. With, you know, we have emotions, we have moods. These are feelings that we feel emotions in our body, right? I mean, they feel to be in our hands sometimes, in our stomachs, in our hearts, in our heads. They're very embodied aspects of experience. And this brings up a whole different area of perception that I haven't even mentioned yet called interoception. Now, when we think about perception, we usually think about perception of the, ex the outside world, like sight, sound, hearing, taste, touch, smell. But a large part of the brain is actually geared towards sensing and, and regulating the body from within. I mean, the, the interior of the body is also sort of sealed off from the brain in some ways. The brain doesn't have direct access to what's going on inside the body. It has to perceive it too. It has to make a best guess too. And so the idea here is that the same process applies. Just as the brain is always making predictions about what's out there in order to figure out what's out there, the brain is also making predictions about what's going on in here. Like how is the heart doing, has lots of gastric tension like, are the blood oxygen at the right levels, all these sorts of physiological variables, physiological properties are being perceived through this process of prediction uh, by the brain. I wrote about this some years ago and called it interoceptive inference. It's the process of, of inferring um, the body, what the body is doing on the inside. And um, there's a big difference though, at least, yeah, it's talking about it in the simplest possible way, which is that when we perceive the outside world, the general aim of the brain is to figure out what's there. You know, is it a bear? Is it a bus? Um, is it a beer? Uh, but when the brain is perceiving the body from the inside, the object isn't to figure out what's in the body. I mean, the brain doesn't really care what my internal organs look like or even whether they exist or not or what shape or colour they are. It cares how well they're doing. So perception of the body from within is all about controlling things rather than finding things out. It turns out that if you have a system in the brain that's very good at making predictions, that's also a very good way of controlling things, like a, like a souped-up central heating system that can predict when a heat wave is coming. Um, so that's a big difference in how these predi uh, predictions are used. And to cut a very long story short... I think this actually ex this explains a good deal about why particular experiences are the way they are. And this takes us all the way back to this idea of this real problem and the idea of explaining different kinds of conscious experience. Visual predictions underpin visual perceptual experience, and they're all about where, what things are, figuring out what's there. Where are they in space? How do they reflect light? So we experience things in space that have colours and they move and so on. But interoceptive predictions about the interior of the body underpin these experiences of embodiment, of being an embodied self. 
not where things are, what colour they are, but how well things are going. That's why our experiences of self at this most basic level aren't in terms of shapes and position, but in terms of valence. Things feel generally good or bad, um, and emotions of various sort of ramifications on that. So what's there versus what's going on? But it's the same basic principle that we can apply to understand different kinds of conscious experience and understand really this is the mechanism underlying the experience of being who we are. Now one implication of this is that consciousness, instead of being some sort of abstract property associated maybe with intelligence or thinking, is actually much more closely related to life than we might have thought. And the idea is all this predictive machinery that underpins everything we experience had its origins evolutionarily over you know, millions of years and developmentally in each of us during our lifetimes and in the here and now, all tied up in this basic imperative that all animals have to stay alive, to regulate their physiology, to keep going. And so there's a very deep connection between consciousness and being alive here. And this is interesting because it's really different from what René Descartes said. René Descartes gets a lot of stick these days for a lot of reasons. One thing he said when he was thinking about other animals, non-human animals, he called them beast machines. And the reason he called them beast machines was he thought they didn't have the kind of conscious rational minds that mattered. He said, without minds to direct their bodily movements, animals must be regarded as unthinking, unfeeling machines that move like clockwork. Um, he did have a pet dog he was very fond of, but... <laughs> He is also known for sort of not extending, not including other animals in this circle of concern for tr species that we think of as, as conscious. Now, I think almost entirely the opposite. In thinking about the nature of our conscious experiences firmly grounded in our basic nature as living machines, as flesh and blood organisms, it seems that conscious selfhood arises because of and not in spite of our beast machine nature. The way we experience the world and the self is intimately tied to this nature that we all have as being self-preserving physiological machines that care about their own persistence. And this for me is a very deeply, deeply embodied view of consciousness and self that, that I actually find quite reassuring. It brings us closer to nature rather than setting us further apart from it. So I'll just finish with a couple of implications about this view, way of thinking. So one of them, and one that we're drilling into a lot more these days, is that because we all have different brains and different bodies, we're all going to experience different realities. We will all see the world in slightly different ways, and sometimes maybe dramatically different ways. Just as we all differ on the outside, we all will differ on the inside too, and we may not realise that because we will always, often, not always, but usually use the same words. When I say something is red, you say something is red. Are we having the same experience? Probably not, but how will we ever know? We can begin to measure that. In fact, we are beginning to measure that. One thing I would hope, I would encourage you all to do is this new project called the Perception Census, which is part of Dream Machine, which we're going to be discussing uh, with Hugh very shortly. Uh, which is the first attempt really to map out this notion of perceptual diversity, this idea that we all differ on the inside and just as we all differ on the outside and there is no single right way of perceiving the world. There's just difference. So that's one implication. The other implication is that just as we all might differ between people, then we're going to be very different when we start comparing other animals. Um, if we think about what it might be like to be an octopus, I spent a week with octopuses about 10 years ago. I still remember it very, very vividly indeed. They're remarkable liquid animals. But just think how an octopus might experience the rubber hand illusion. It's almost impossible to figure out what it might like, be like to be an octopus. They have more neurons in their arms together than they have in their central brain. The central brain doesn't always seem to know where its individual arms are. So you probably couldn't do the rubber tentacle illusion on an octopus. It just wouldn't work. But the sense of self an octopus, imagine, imagine you just not having an idea where your limbs are and they're just doing their own thing, but in a way that seems entirely natural. That would be weird. And the final implication is that 
Consciousness is much more tied to our nature as living machines than we might previously thought. If this is the case, then the idea that artificial intelligence will become conscious at some point is just basically misplaced. Consciousness is not a function of intelligence. You don't have to be smart to suffer, but you do have to be alive. So the wetware matters. Hardware isn't enough. So let me bring this together and then finish. What we started with was this idea that what we consciously see depends on the brain's best guesses about the causes of the sensory signals, best guesses about what's out there. And this also applies to the body. The experience of the body of being a self is another kind of perceptual best guess. But there's a difference. The, especially when it comes to perceiving the body from within, these perceptual predictions have more to do with controlling the body than figuring out what's there, which is why we experience the interior of the body, this basis level of being a self the way we do. And so all together, you put this all together, we perceive the world around us and ourselves within it with, through, and because of our living bodies. OK, so I'm going to very smoothly segue now because there's two things I want to talk about into just a, a tiny bit about the dream machine. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time because I had to stop the thing. Right, OK, not very well for time. Um, so this is just a very quick intro to the dream machine, which is happening here in Belfast at the moment. And then we'll have a conversation and then, then a quick Q&A. So the Dream Machine, how many people have seen it? Have people here been to the Dream Machine in Belfast? A few of you, good, but yeah, many of you still yet to go, which is great. Um, maybe this will encourage you, maybe not. So the Dream Machine is a project I've been working on for a couple of years, and it's based on an idea that's quite old in neuroscience. This is the neuroscientist William Gray Walter in the 1950s. And in his book, The Living Brain, which is an amazing book from 1953, he has a chapter in this book called Revelation by Flicker. And what he talks about in this book is how if you, if you shine flashing lights at a very specific frequency at somebody's face and they've got their eyes closed, these people have incredible visual experiences. Even though their eyes are closed, even though the light is just flashing white light, people tend to have vivid, coloured uh, experiences of rich colour, of movement, of kaleidoscopic patterns, sometimes even more than that. And this has been known for a long time, but it's always been a little on the fringes of neuroscience. We started working this in, on this in my lab about 10 years ago. We've got a strobe light in the lab. That's me sitting in front of it. And trying to understand, well, what's happening in the brain when it's exposed to this kind of stimulation. Because you see colour, but there's no colours there. Um, now, we're still working on, on this uh, as a research project, but it's become also a big public engagement project too, called the Dream Machine. And this actually started a couple of years ago and uh, launched in London in May this year. And I just want to play this short video, which gives a sense of it and in, will introduce you a little bit to the team behind it. So this lasts for about five minutes and then I'm done. So the Dream Machine was an idea from an article called Brian Geisen. So the story goes, he was on a bus uh, going down a really straight tree-lined road on a sunny day and he was falling asleep against the window. He described himself as entering this transcendental state and he saw extraordinary visuals, colours, patterns, kaleidoscopic shapes and as soon as the bus left the trees it stopped. His invention, the Dream Machine, was really simple. So it was a pattern cylinder that you put on a record player, you hang a light bulb inside, and then the light comes through the holes in the cylinder at the right frequency to, to kind of create this. Rather than seeing it as an object, we're turning this into an experience. One of the most radical things is that we are inviting the public to come in and to shut their eyes and do nothing. One of the great joys of the Dream Machine project is that the scientific and the philosophical aspects have been built into the project from the very beginning. We're investigating a phenomenon that's still not widely understood, how flickering light generates this kaleidoscopic, vivid, immersive range of experiences for people. 
So we're really making something that is um, internal and quite transcendental and personal into a collective experience. Because of the nature of the experience, we're hoping that what will really happen is that it will engender conversation. And so every stage of the dream machine has been designed in a way to really enable people um, to talk to each other. This particular project is unlike anything because your eyes are closed and your brain is creating the visual. It's the first time I've actually composed something specifically to be played in a 360-dimensional sound. So that's allowed me to do more, much more than I've ever done. There are more sounds in there than, than I would put in a stereo track. So it's a little bit like moving from black and white to colour. It's an incredible experience um, and you have to think about the placement of sounds in a whole new way. Every time we revisit the music, John has moved it on to another level. It's got to this really extraordinary place now, and it's totally enveloping. And it's quite an extraordinary thing when you hear it and experience it live. So I think the general public's minds will be blown by this project. It's so novel, it's so unlike anything else that's been rolled out. And I think the combination of a synchronous light show with this amazing 360 panoramic sound will be an extremely powerful experience. Collaboration and creativity is at the epicenter of this project. This conjoining of um, you know, artists and composers, people that have worked on incredibly well-known creative projects around the UK and indeed around the world. You've got left brain, right brain sort of working together in, in collaboration. What's really exciting is thinking about young people engaging in this and taking part in this and seeing themselves as well in the bigger picture. It's almost something that's trained out of us to ask those massive philosophical questions about life who you are in the world, what it means to be you, how you're connected to others, and really to keep that depth of inquiry in those resources for the classroom. The Perception Census is going to be one of the largest scientific research studies ever carried out into perception. An understanding of the brain, the mind and perception helps us understand why we experience the world the way that we do. I think that the perception census is exciting for participants. Firstly, because they will learn that we're all unique and we're all different and we all perceive the world in different ways. And that's quite eye-opening, I think. And what we also hope to do is to give feedback to participants so that they will understand what their perception is like and how it compares to other people. I think increasingly we absorb culture in, in kind of very like isolated individual ways. Um, you could transition from cinema to TV to phones. And I think the opportunity to break that open and to create a, a cultural experience that isn't about consumption, but is about self-generation and reflection is extremely exciting. For me, seeing the responses of participants when they come out the other side of the curtain and they've just had this experience and they look to each other or, or they look at us, it's just so rare and so magical um, that, that someone can have that surprise in their life and, and that you can share in that moment. Being inside this thing is kind of magic. It completely sort of envelops you it saw the entire universe go by behind my own closed eyes. I'm, I'm severely visually impaired. And norm, normally I, I very struggle to, to see colours. I saw colours that I haven't seen for years. Vibrant, powerful, passionate colours. It was just absolutely, I found the whole experience absolutely fascinating. It made me feel quite, yeah, emotional. It's just when you come out you think, wow, that, that felt really, really brilliant. I'd, I'd recommend it to anyone, um, regardless of their age, because they could get the same feeling. Having the ability, like, Dream Machine accessing that part in your brain, which is like, this is what your subconscious is thinking about, like, without you even knowing. It's just like, our brains are powerful. <laughs> they are very powerful things. I would, I would consider it a life-changing thing to go through, 100%. This is, yeah, this is happening in Belfast um, until early September and it is completely free, so if you do want to go, I reckon you should. This is what it looks like from the inside. It's in the Carlisle Memorial Church, which I think isn't 
far from here. I'm going there tomorrow myself to, to look at it. Um, but I think I'll leave it there, and I think we'll move to the, to the discussion with Hugh and, and then a Q&A. And we'll talk mainly about Dream Machine, but thank you very much for your attention on this talk so far. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, never like to lose you quickly. Do come back now. Um, uh, yes, the Dream Machine. Um, uh, I should have mentioned that in my uh, preamble, but it was really fascinating. I am a deeply cynical person, and for the first 10 minutes, my cynicism stayed strong. But as the experience went through, it had profound and, and, and very interesting and challenging effects on what my brain did, and I saw things, and I didn't even do the full thing either. So I can imagine that uh, it, it, the, 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 the full 100% um, experience is, is quite extraordinary. Um, and it's in Carlisle uh, Memorial Church, which if you've never been in it, is an experience all of itself. Um, so it is really, if you go to see and do one thing this year, participate in that. And I'll thank you very much for that. Um, it was, I'm sure you're quite exhausted after that. Even a man used to lecturing every day for, <laughs> for a living. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, how, how did... You, you mentioned as a boy that you were kind of intrigued by consciousness. Yeah. Can you um, maybe explain how that then became your interest in the subject as a career? Well, I think I, I, I managed to get lucky, basically. I think we're all interested in it in some ways. And... Um, for some, and I actually stopped doing it for a while. So I think as a kid, so I remember, I remember, like you know, when you're a teenager, you often have these arguments about: Does free will exist? Do we have free will? And you never get anywhere, of course, in, in these discussions. But they are important, and they mm. are kind of fundamental. To, and, and I think I had the idea at the time that there, there was nothing more to see here; that these were sort of old arguments that would never be resolved or had been resolved. I didn't realise that they're actually very current. Yeah. very important, and progress is being made. Mm -hmm. And I think there's the, the, the way our education system is set up and the career system is set up tries to drive people away from these big questions yeah. because they don't translate to, to careers very <laughs> easily. So there's a good reason to do it. Yeah. But um, I just kept asking them. And, mm. But for a while, it, it didn't happen. Now, when I was doing my, my undergraduate degree in psychology, mm. I was told consciousness was... Done. A bit of a dirty word. It was, it was like career suicide. Uh -huh. In fact, there was, the, there was this encyclopedia of psychology written by Stuart Sutherland, who yeah. was uh, fat, one of the earliest profs at Sussex in psychology. And in his dictionary of psychology, he, under the definition of consciousness, he said, consciousness is a mysterious phenomenon. Mm. Um, no one knows what it's for, how it works, or what it does. Nothing worth reading has ever been written on it. Right. Just not Seems a, good, a bit damning. <laughs> it's a, a bit little damning. bit damning. Mm -hmm. But eventually I just kept coming back to it and coming back to it. Mm. And around you know, 20 years ago or so, um, I was doing my PhD, mm -hmm. the atmosphere just changed. What, what, was there a particular thing that happened? Was it something to do with the internet? Was it something to do with kind of... Open it up or...? It was to do with... Well, it, it, it never really went away. So there were always subcultures of, of psychologists and neuroscientists working on this mm. that you don't hear about when, when you were younger, that, that I didn't hear about before. It was always there in the background. But then a couple of things really changed. One was um, people died. You know, the, the people yeah. who were sort of most against studying consciousness. Because <laughs> psychology up until that point, basically in the early 20th century, didn't mm. even study mental states. It was all about behaviour. Right. Especially in the West, in America, mm. it was all like, let's just look at what rats do when they press levers. Let's right. not even think about inner mental states. Mm. Uh, and that whole focus on behaviour, behaviourism, had to sort of diminish a bit. Then people started thinking about mental states. And of mm. course, once you start thinking about mental states, consciousness is not so far away. Mm. The other thing that really changed was brain imaging. So right. around the 1990s, suddenly we have these new technologies, these telescopes for the brain, these ability to look inside. Mm. And, see, and I still think it's somewhat miraculous mm. that we have devices, machines. We can look inside somebody's brain while they're doing something, while mm. they're having an experience. And so we can start to get two kinds of data about consciousness. We can get data about what people experience yeah. because they can tell us. Mm. And we can also get data about what's going on in their brain. Yeah. Of course, there were methods like this 
long before we still use them, like EEG, which measures electrical activity. That's mm. a very odd. That's the famous sort of thing with all yeah, the, the kind of on the head cap stuff, of yeah. sensors. But functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, mm -hmm. people will notice, because whenever you see like a depiction of brain imaging in the media, it's usually one of these, you see little hot spots everywhere. 24 they hours look, in A&E, it's always, you know, is there a blood clot? Yeah, some, something like that, you see hot spots. So, but it's that, and then the third thing, the last thing was, there were a couple of Nobel Prize winners. Mm -hmm. Who, like one was Francis Crick, who was the co-discoverer mm. with Jim Watson of the structure of DNA, mm. and Gerald Edelman, who actually I did my postdoc with in San Diego. Mm -hmm. He won his Nobel Prize for immunology. Yeah. They basically took that, you know, their work is done. Once you've got, got a Nobel Prize, <laughs> you can do whatever you want. And yeah. so they turned to focus on consciousness. And mm. that gave, gave the field a legitimacy that it previously didn't, didn't have. Mm. And so all these things together, I think, just change things. The society for this scientific study of consciousness started mm. around this time, and I've been a part of that for about 15 years as well. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting in terms of how, where we are as a society as well, in terms of trying to yeah, further our understanding of why we think we are and how we engage with the world around us. Um, at the same time as technologies like virtual reality and, and immersive technologies and things like that are, are kind of um, uh, coming to the fore. Was, was something like the Dream Machine, or in, in terms of engagement with the ideas that you've been working on for 25 years, was that the perfect vehicle? It's been an unexpectedly powerful vehicle, actually, mm -hmm. because, because, I mean, firstly, you're, you're right. I think there is uh, a social, even political, urgency to understanding more about consciousness. Yeah. It's, it's often considered to be this, like, abstract philosophical musing. Like, mm. you do, you know, it's what people, they do something useful, and once you've done something useful, you can sit back and think about free will. Yeah, the bat and, thing, and, you know, exactly. it's a very abstract. But, but there, are, there are so many reasons why it's important to study. I mean, the, the, the most fundamental being to satisfy our human curiosity yeah. about who we are. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a really deep and really significant reason to bring us closer to nature, mm -hmm. you know, to, to not think of us as always separate from it, like mm -hmm. Copernicus did. We're not at the centre of the universe. Yes. We're, just, we're just in a, a speck in the vast distance in mm -hmm. the abyss. And then Darwin did that we're not separate from other animals. We're, we're all living mm -hmm. creatures. Um, and consciousness is sort of the last, uh, last thing there, the last bastion of our human exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to, to break that down mm. so that we can see ourselves more clearly as part of nature. Mm. But then in, in practice too, there's, I mean, there's this recent debate about uh, this, this poor child, Archie Battersby, who yeah. had brain damage, and arguments between lawyers about whether to keep him on life support. Mm. This shouldn't be an argument between lawyers, right? Yeah. We, should, we need a, a science of consciousness to know what to do in those mm. situations. That's developing. Mm -hmm. That's available. Um, psychiatry and, and mental health. We yeah. need better ways to understand what's going on. Animal welfare. There's so many reasons why it's actually quite negligent of us as a society to not have to just ignore a, a the better subject. understanding. Yeah. And so, so when something like an opportunity, like, how, well, I should, yeah. should ask, how did you get involved in Dream Machine? I said in Dream Machine, yeah. it, was, um, it, it was much as I, I said, we've been working on this, this fascinating experience yeah. of you know, stroboscopically induced visual hallucinations, mm -hmm. what, it's, what it was called since the 50s. Um, but I hadn't realised there'd been a parallel history in art, this guy Brian Geisen yeah. that, that Jennifer Crick mentioned in the video, uh, and Brian Geisen had this idea that the, this was such a, a powerful phenomenon, he wanted to make it more popular than television, and you know, he failed. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it was still burbling along in the background mm. too. Um, I didn't know anything about that. We'd just been working in, in the lab as a sort of side project on this, this strobe light thing because mm. it was just fascinating. And then uh, Jennifer just, just called me just mm. in early 2020. I remember it because she was the last person I shook hands with before the world shut down. <laughs> and um, just came and had this, this vision for, for doing this at mm. scale, which... That must have been quite frustrating. Uh, that you had this this vision and this kind of this huge new project that you could work on, and then bang. Well, at that time, it wasn't it wasn't anything more than an idea. Oh, so right, actually, okay. we talked about it, and then you know we, mm. we all had much more to worry about. And True. I didn't really think about it again until the end of 2020, when she called again and said, "Hey, there's this unboxed festival that mm. might give us many millions of pounds to do this." And I thought, "That's crazy. Who's going to give us millions of pounds to do <laughs> to like flash lights at people?" Well, um, yeah. and you know that's that's what happened mm -hmm. eventually. 
And yeah, we built out this team with, with, you know, with musicians like John Hopkins mm. and architects. And what I really loved about it was that in many sort of science art collaborations, mm. the, the engagement, despite what people may say, is often a little bit superficial. It can yeah. be a, sometimes a bit one directional too, like scientific inspiration of art or, yeah. or, or art providing data for science. Mm. But the dream machine, I think you got a sense from the video, all these components played into it at the beginning, mm -hmm. and that dialogue has been fundamental to it throughout. So yeah. when I talk about it, I end up talking as much about the architecture and the sound design and the, the engineering design as about the, the science. I think it's interesting because one of the things that it also does is because of the evaluation process, so you go in and there's a prep for tra pe uh, uh, sort of preparedness speech, you get ready for it, you go in, you experience it, and you come out the other side, and there's this huge level of ev evaluation. Anyone who's ever been involved in the arts knows that you have to fill out some kind of form at the end to say where you're from and you know what social background you came from and those sort of things to satisfy the funders. This is on a on a very very different level. You are actually taking part in a kind of like a major experiment in terms of how it works. Um, was that a key element to selling it to, to selling the idea? Yes and no. So right. one of the challenges of, of being the, the the scientist on the project, the mm. lead scientist, was that. It mustn't feel like an experiment. It isn't an experiment. No, you know, no, it, not in this trick. But that, this was really tricky because you know when we think about collecting data or finding mm. something out, you know, it's usually from the perspective of what data do we need? How do we get it? How yeah. do we make sure it's appropriate for the question? Um, for the dream machine, the the fundamental principle is this has to be like an offer to the public. It's mm. not. It's, it's not an invitation for them to help us with an experiment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an experience for them. Mm. And so, yes, you're right, people go, they have the main Dream Machine experience after some sort of preparation. That's all part of the, the journey, all part of the experience. And then afterwards, there's this area we call the reflection zone. Yeah. It's an important part of the whole journey for each individual participant. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to do the Dream Machine and just get spat back out onto Straight the high street. The street yeah. um, there's this space for assimilation, for yeah. consideration, for, for communication, talking mm -hmm. to others too. Um, and in that space also people can, I didn't get, didn't show, but people will make drawings of what they saw. Yeah, there's a huge Sounds range a corny, of evaluation. incredible. Yeah. Mm. And also go through some sort of more systematic reflections. Mm. And yes, we learn a lot from them, but it doesn't, at least I hope not, for the people going, it never feels like they're a subject in an experiment. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was, but it was quite exciting to take part in it, um, in the sense that y you actually felt that you were valued, I think, is the thing. Um, very often in an artistic si situation, essentially you buy your ticket, you go in, you yeah. get, and you go out the other side. Sometimes you get a survey sent to you at the end of it. But in terms of the actual experiment, I, what you can do with the budget and what you can't do with the budget, two mm -hmm. very different things. But I think that there was a sense that uh, somebody was holding you all the way through the process. Mm -hmm. It was quite interesting. That is what good of a like really gold standard evaluation is all about. Um, and I should ask, you know, what you, you mentioned the participation or the, the uh, perception senses yeah. as well. Yeah. Is that a separate to unboxed or no? No, that's right. part of it, and that right. is more that is sold more as an experiment, yeah. right? So, so one of the things in the dream machine um, that's very clear, and those of you who've been already may have noticed this when talking to others, mm. everybody has a unique experience. Mm. They're all going through the same thing, but again, because we all have different brains, and we're all, we, we enter it in different states of mind mm. too bring our daily <laughs> self to the experience. People have unique journeys. Yeah. And um, this, is a, this is a trigger for people to start thinking about, what if they have different experiences there? Maybe they have different experiences all the time. Mm -hmm. This is to your earlier point mm -hmm. that, that the dream machine is really a powerful vehicle for igniting a latent curiosity that people have mm -hmm. about the brain, about perception, mm -hmm. about the mind. Because you, you just have... You know, it makes very clear in the first person, mm. in somebody's lived experience, that what they perceive isn't to be taken for granted. It isn't just the world flooding in through these transparent windows and there you, there you go. Mm. You, know, the, you can you experience for yourself the brain's generative power. Mm. And it's one thing to be told that, it's another thing to Actually experience, experience it, it yourself. And yeah. now you know, more than 25,000 have already mm. had that experience, which is, a, I think, a, a, a really good number. Um, and then 
the journey, yeah, doesn't end when people leave the building either because mm. we, we do want to, to encourage people to keep thinking about what it means for them. Mm. Um, so there are lots of resources about neuroscience and perception that people can, can follow up, but also this perception census is, an, is a semi-independent study, and this is... Uh, the, it's an online set of sh very fun and engaging, again, so much better than we would do if we were just left to our own devices yeah. in the lab. When yeah. you've got these amazing graphic design studios working mm -hmm. with you, you can do things in so much uh, better way. Yeah. Um, but these are simple illusions and things that if enough people do them, we will get a sense of how uh, different people experience the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious, I really don't know what we'll find. I mean, I was mm. reading an article on the, on the flight over today about emotional differences between cultures. And there's this whole idea that you know, in different cultures, there are different words for different emotions and this question about whether people mm. actually have different emotions. So, you know, in Danish, there's this hygge emotion, yeah, the sort of yeah. coziness. Do Danish people actually have a different emotion or do they just have a different word that we would take longer to describe? Yeah, okay. It's very yeah, that, that's a very interesting point because language is meant to be sort of you know just right. a replacement of the word, but the, the meaning stays the same. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. But but there's this long-standing philosophical question about whether language and culture shape experience mm -hmm. rather than just describe it. Mm -hmm. And something like the perception census gives us a handle on that. We can start to measure that mm -hmm. in a way that's much more quantitative than than asking people about you know, what emotion they might experience. And imagine if we took the dream machine to different cultures as well. We'd yeah. love to take it to South America mm -hmm. or yeah. India. Mm -hmm. What will people see? We have no idea. Mm -hmm. And also, I suppose, there's, um, those kind of immersive experiences, maybe there are cultures that are more used to that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, that it's a sort of long, long-standing kind of cultural tradition in terms of you know, sweat tents and, and those kind of ideas of immersing yourself to to experience things and to come out the other side slightly to change or slightly different mm -hmm. uh, in that sense. Um, it's very interesting. I should always ask, you know, all this data, where, you know, what will you do with it? I mean, will it, will, will it sort of create studies or, you know... I mean, uh, we'll keep track of it so we can, tr can control people's lives. Well, well I was going to, yes. There, there, was, there, was part of me that, there was part of me that worried <laughs> about this new technology selling me more Pepsi. You know, I think, I think since the rise of Facebook and the social media and Web 2.0, whatever it is, there is a sense that technology is a slightly... Uh, or yeah. new science is something to be slightly suspicious of yeah. um, in the sense that it's not so much the initial idea it's the bad actors that come along later on uh, and maybe say well we can use this to do this or we can use this to do this do you ever worry about that you know you asked me this and when we were chatting mm -hmm. before before and i ha honestly hadn't thought of this it's clearly <laughs> true in the, in the um it's in the in the context of something like facebook yeah you know, i don't know what the original intentions of zuckerberg were when so they did. may women, have been completely benign and then yeah. then it got sort of you know misappropriated mm -hmm. or evolved in a particular way Something like this, I, to be honest, I don't really, I don't really see it. You know, it, mm. it's it's a it's a personal, individual experience that people have. You don't use it to convey a message. I think it it has this peculiar effect because we're also doing it in in groups. So there's this interesting balance sure. of the individual and the collective. Everybody has their own experience, but they all have their individual journeys mm. together. And when they talk about it after, and I don't know what what you felt about this, mm. but that that can serve as some sort of glue. And what we found, actually, in the, um, in the various prototype sessions that we ran before the launch in, in London, mm. um, we, we followed some groups of, of people who would come to test out early versions. And they really bonded. I mean, they, they really... Yeah. As if they'd gone through the shared experience. And mm. They would go to the pub together and they, 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 okay. they, would, they would keep in touch. I, yeah. I, I don't know how much this has happened. One of the things, to, to your other point, is, like, we... Uh, I think quite rightly, all mm. the data that we get is fully anonymous. Um, yeah. So we have no idea what people will do with it later mm. on. Um, but what, what we will do with the data that is completely anonymous mm. is, is kind of exploratory. And to, we haven't even started looking, looking at it yet. Yes, there's a long way to go. It's, yeah. it's, um, we're still delivering the, the project. Uh, but just to get a sense of what the range of individual experiences are. Mm -hmm. And then if there's also the, the hope that people who do the dream machine experience that will also do the perception census. And yeah. there's an invitation for people, the dream machine, to do this second one. And if they do that, 
then we'll be able to link things together oh, okay. and we might be able to understand a bit more about why people mm. have particular kinds of journeys in the dream machine mm. you know, is it what what does it go along with in the specific other ways yeah. that they might experience the world yeah uh, as someone who's worked at uh, kind of you know arts marketing for a long time some of it does sound like uh, what we call segmentation and kind of you know these are the people who react and have emotions that way and, and that sort of stuff so i mean i think that you know we live in the real world and there's always mm -hmm. potential for all sorts of learning to be used in different ways but i think that maybe the thing that worried me i think was about hypno hypnosis and it was very interesting ah. what you were saying in the talk about mm -hmm. hypnosis you know who's susceptible to it and all that sort of stuff and mm -hmm. it wasn't so much that i thought i was going to end up like running down the street dressed as a chicken <laughs> or you know that sort of thing but that was a slight fear Anybody who was ever at the Arts Theatre with Barry Sinclair back in the 1990s might remember that. But um, there's a, you know, our minds are quite precious and they are under a lot of kind of stress at the yeah. moment. Um, and I suppose that was maybe a fear going in was, you know, I feel like every time I open my phone, I'm being kind of either sold to or used or tracked or understood or, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I must say that the whole experience wasn't like that. It was very different. But it, I'm sure that'll be a fear for people about their, you know, their, it's not just your email address you're giving away, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it's, it's I think the general experience is indeed the opposite of that. Mm, yeah, you, know, I, you, you, you leave your phones outside. It's, it's sort of, it's, some, it's kind of meditative for most yeah, people that, that, that you, yeah. you just sort of sit back into the, the sort of power and beauty of your own mind mm. for half an hour mm. or however long it is. Um, I, yeah, I just, I don't, I, 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 it's worth thinking about, but I, I right. don't know how it could be sort of misused well, in the same way that social media has turned no, out that's, to be incredibly that, that's true. divisive. And, 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 you know, it, it is, I was going to say, it's, you know, it's not hypnosis, it's a freeing yeah. experience. Actually, what the bizarre thing about it is that you're, uh, you know, all the stress, all the pressures, all that sort of stuff, actually, it frees you from that. Uh, and... What I felt, you talk about the potential of the brain. Yeah. Uh, the un I mean, a lot of people talk about the untapped potential of the human brain. Was it 95% or whatever? Oh, that? some nonsense yeah, figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that sort of thing, you know, uh, that was the feeling that I got, actually, that there was things starting to move and things starting to kind of change in me. So I think, I think it was a positive experience in that sense. And another, another sort of design principle for the whole thing mm. was, I think, addressing that worry a little bit. So the idea that because it can be quite a powerful experience for mm. people, um, it's important they feel they still have agency over that yeah. experience. They still feel in control. Mm. So that's, that's sort of explained very clearly. People have, a, have a, an eye mask that they can yep. pull over their eyes and that just will pull back from the experience. Mm. Um, they can leave if they want and sometimes people do. So it's, it's not something that you're completely just opening yourself up and being vulnerable and, and exposed you, mm. you're always in control and it was you know yet you're going on a journey that you can't predict and yeah. might be unexpected for you no, i thought it was uh, it was fascinating and you know someone who works in cinema which always trying to get people to come together to, to do things the collective element of it was was great we seem to be hurtling towards more and more solipsistic kind of experiences and yes it was individual but it was collective in the same way that cinema when you see three thousand people in a cinema they're watching exactly the same thing, but they're perceiving it in very, very different ways um, because of the films they've watched before or the memories that they've had as a child and all that sort of stuff. And actually, reading your work this week has really given me quite an understanding of that, quite interestingly. So, um, I'm conscious of time. Haha, <laughs> a little science joke there. Um, so, uh, if you have any questions, could we get the house lights up? Uh, maybe so we can see people. Um, Anyone want to stick their hand up and, and have a question or make a comment or how you feel? Anyone went to the Dream Machine and wants to say something about the Dream Machine? Um, anyone up there? Hello? I see a hand over there. Oh, yeah, we've got a hand up There's the top there. Up at the top balcony. Yes, not sure if I can, I can ask two questions. Two questions, yeah. Two questions is fine. Two for the price of one. Now we're sort of uh, keeping up in, in the medical uh, research. 
Yeah, thank you. Two very good questions. So the first one was about this, this Google engineer called Blake Lim Wan, who um, got fired from Google for posting a blog thing where he, 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 he argued that he'd been working on what Google called, or what people in our called large language models. These are these pieces of software that can spout out plausible sounding sentences when you type in something plausible sounding. And Blake Lim Wan was convinced that his large language model was conscious, was sentient, and ought to be, and we ought to worry about turning the computer off at night. And um, this got such a huge amount of media play, right? It was, it was, it was sort of everywhere. Op-eds were written in, in all kinds of papers, which I found incredibly frustrating because it's obviously bollocks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. These large language models, they just are good at making predictions. Mm -hmm. Not the kind, not, not the, and similar predictions to, to what our brains make, but basically they're just big statistical pattern recognition devices. The language, they literally have no idea what they're saying. And, and you notice in some of the dialogue from, from this particular model, it was called Lambda, I think one of the pieces of dialogue was like, what makes you happy? And the response from Lambda was friends and family. <laughs> like, you have no friends and family. You're speaking <laughs> rubbish. It doesn't understand anything. So the interesting question for me is why there was such a fury about it. Like, why did the guy think it was conscious? And I think the answer to that is sort of, there's this weird and slightly, well, quite worrying, I'm talking about things to worry about, mm -hmm. the whole tech industry, especially in the west coast of the US, has this kind of, you know, tech bro utopia nonsense about it where people think they're on the cusp of immortality and uploading themselves to the cloud mm -hmm. and, and all this stuff. And so the idea of being, you know, at the, at the edge where conscious machines finally happen is, you know, I think it's driving a lot of, a lot of that. There's this kind of, yeah, weird techno rapture business going on. Um, and there's this association with consciousness and intelligence. It, it's, it's totally opposed to the view that I've come to, which is consciousness is about, mostly about our body, about being alive, not about spouting out uh, a, a semi-convincing piece of language. So that's that one. Psychedelic drugs, a lot, yeah, I think a really exciting research um, so I've been involved a little bit with this, with this too, analysing some data, for, you know, analysing data in collaboration with people um, uh, who've taken LSD or psilocybin, sort of ketamine, things like that. It's a really powerful method for consciousness science because much like anaesthesia, you change the brain and you change people's experiences. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. And also for, for clinical applications too. A lot of potential for things like PTSD, depression. However... There's been, it's one of these things where it was, it was kind of outlawed for so long, the pendulum has swung really fast. And I think it's swung a bit too much in the other direction now. There's a lot of hype and a lot of money behind uh, psychedelic research, research now. Lots of startups. And you know, it will, and, and a lot of these is based on the idea that it's some kind of panacea. You know, you take one dose, one trip on, on psilocybin and your depression mm -hmm. is gone. It won't be that simple. And I think there's, a, there's probably a correction happening. And I just worry, I don't want the hype to go too far so that the correction is too, too severe. Because it really, I think there's a lot there, but it's not the answer to everything. Okay. Thank you. But, uh, thanks very much for that question. Um, yes, uh, we've got two gentlemen, uh, gentlemen in the white shirt first. Uh, just wait for the microphone, if you would, so we can all hear you. Very enjoyable talk, thank you. Um, just a, a question, um, just, uh, I'm not sure if I fully understand it. You said that um, consciousness is not necessarily a function of intelligence, it's more a function of life, or our bodies and stuff like that. Um, but can, can consciousness be experienced without intelligence? You know, do you know what I'm getting at? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you have something that is zero-level intelligence, can it experience consciousness? Yeah, I think that's a good question, and I think the answer is probably not. So I think they are separate, but I don't think they're totally independent. So, you know, what, what does zero intelligence mean? It means, like, well, what does intelligence mean? I haven't really defined it. It's not the ability to solve crossword problems, necessarily. It's, it's, you know, it's just broadly the ability to do the right thing at the right time, if you think about intelligence across 
species. So something with zero intelligence is not going to do anything. It's not going to be interesting. So there's probably like some minimal level that that's necessary. Um, but the, what I'm trying to get at is push back against this intuition that consciousness is a function of intelligence. That, you know, whether it's in biological creatures or in machines, that, you know, as intelligence starts to go up, things can be unconscious and then, bang, there's a point at which the lights come on. And there's enough intelligence and then, then the more intelligent, the more conscious. You know, I don't think that's, that's true at all. Like, being intelligent is not sufficient for being conscious. I think it's perfectly plausible that we will have machines that, that are intelligent in a real sense. I, mean, I don't think we're there yet, but I, I don't see any, in principle, objection to intelligent machines. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that then we will therefore have conscious machines. Um, they're, they're, they're separable in that sense. So you can be smart. I think you can definitely be intelligent without being conscious, and maybe current machines, future machines will, will do that. Can you be conscious without being intelligent? Well, yes, once you've got a minimal amount. And like the most fundamental kind of consciousness, again, I think it's, not, it's, it's a personal view, is experiences of things like suffering, pain, mm. joy. You don't have to be, have lots of intelligence to you know, have a basic experience of disgust as being relevant to your prospects of survival. Mm. And this, this association of consciousness and intelligence, I also think it's just a residue of our human exceptionalism. You know, we, we think we're special as a species. We always have done, and this has always been a great danger to us. It's been, you know, we thought we were at the centre of the universe. We thought we were special. And we think we're intelligent, and so we know consciousness is kind of special, and so we tend to associate the two together as a way of reinforcing our sort of species-specific arrogance. Um, and if we break that association, then we might be more likely to see consciousness where it really is uh, in species that don't strike us as being particularly smart by our questionable standards of human uh, you know, of human intelligence anyway. Mm. Um, oh, we've got pretty time for, yeah, one, one more question, sir. Uh, gentleman in the black t-shirt there, sir, if you just wait for the microphone number. Uh, thank you. Um, so you, you mentioned in your talk about the role of prediction a, a more, it's a bigger role than perception, which doesn't really bode well for a world losing touch with the idea of objective realities or truth. And so I was just wondering if, if there was anything in your research that had maybe um, give some hope <laughs> that we could rally around something that was true. Like oh, I mean, up till now, I suppose philosophically, all we've had to rally around was the idea that I think therefore I am. So is there anything that's come out that you've seen? That yeah, it's, a, it's a good question. I, yeah, so I mean, my slogan would be, I predict myself, therefore I am, rather than I think, therefore I am. I think with a view like this, there, there, are, there are two ways to look at it. There, there are pros and cons. The first thing is, it's not, it's not a kind of license to dive into complete relativism, right? I use the, this, the term controlled hallucination. The control is just as important as the hallucination bit. You know, our perceptual experiences might be different, but they're not arbitrary. You know, if we, we, I am here, you are here, there, there's a voice going on. We, we can all agree about, about that. Um, so there is, there, there is a real, you know, at least in my view, there is a real world out there. And our perceptions, in mo unless we are you know, taking drugs or have got brain damage or something, um, or, or really severe psychiatric illness, our perceptions are related to that objective reality in a very lawful, reliable, and, some, and generally useful way. Of course, not always useful because you know, our perceptual systems evolve to deal with situations over a particular spatial scale and time scale, which is why we're horrible about dealing with challenges like climate change, because we don't perceive them in, in the right way. Um, so it's not, it's not as hopeless as, as you might think, but what, what I th the cause for greater hope is, I think, the recognition that this is going on, the recognition that our perceptual experience is constructed, can give us a bit of humility about the way we see things. 
Mm -hmm. If we just assume that what we see really is the way it is, and I, you know, it, it's like people who read different newspapers and, and believe that that's actually the truth, and people who read you know, you know, the Daily Mail and believe that actually is what, what's going on. I mean, that's really disturbing. <laughs> um, and if you know that you know, the newspapers you read are biased in a particular way, that provides, you know, that provides the resources to manage that bias, to overcome it. To actually build connections, you know, it's, the, it's one of the oldest like tropes, isn't it? That to bring people together, you first have to recognise and, and appreciate the difference, and not just assume that that your reality is everybody else's reality. So I think there is a lot of cause for hope. And in my own life, you know, I, I think this has been actually quite deeply affecting that that I do walk around and try to reflect a lot, and it happens automatically now that my experience at any time is is not a direct reflection of how things are. You know, it's dependent on the peculiarities of my brain and, and, and my body and my past and my history and, and my culture. Not completely, but to some extent. And you know, if you kind of deeply bed that into your, you know, to your daily life, I think it does lead you to, to a different place and I think a, a kind of hopeful place. Mm. Though I don't really know because I, I don't have a different me to compare to that didn't do this. That's the problem with that. Um, as I mentioned, Anna will be um, signing books. Are you happy enough to sign books? I'm very happy to sign books. Sign and meet. Yeah. Uh, I'd sign it in the foyer uh, just after there. So if you go purchase a copy, then um, you can uh, you can get your book uh, published. Published. Signed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my, my, my mind. You know, I, my my my, my uh, prediction machine just went slightly dodgy there. Um, so, uh, so really, to uh, to wrap up, um, thank you very much uh, for for coming out tonight. Please do, if you can, go to the Dream Machine. Uh, it's a great experience, and uh, really want to be uh, to be it sort of lights a fire, uh, which I believe a lot of your work, Anil, has done in terms of your writing and uh, and how you've expressed it tonight. So, last thing is just to say thank you very much to Anil. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I got a bit, uh, got a bit carried away there. Again. <laughs> Oh, thanks, yeah. You must be naked. They might take away my life. I just want some.